A number of years ago, I was snowboarding on a beautiful powder day and managed to find myself running full pelt into a tree. I completely ruptured my medial collateral ligament, my MCL, and I needed to get it reconstructed. By the time I got off crutches and out of the brace, my left quad had withered to about half of its original size. When I got tested, the nerves connecting to my muscle weren't firing either. The EMG readings were about 90% lower for my left leg than they were for my right. Now, I hated rehabilitation. I'd never been in the gym and I really didn't enjoy it. So the right thing would have been to set me a goal, right? Well, we've all heard that goal setting is an important component for success. We've been told that goals should be both short and long term and focus on the behavior as well as the outcome. And most commonly, we've been told that they should be SMART. You know the acronym. All of them start by talking about how goals need to be specific and measurable. Not goals like get fit, which aren't specific and are hard to measure, but instead things like run five kilometers this week, because now fitness means running and distance is something we can measure. The A often stands for being either action oriented, agreed upon or achievable. I'm gonna talk about achievable and agreed upon later, but goal setters insist that goals should be focused on the behavior that's in your control instead of the outcome at the end of the day. After all, you can change your behavior right now, but you don't get the outcome for months. The R usually stands for something like realistic, which is basically the same thing as achievable, right? Some people say that goals should be challenging in order to push you to get the best performance, but others say calm down, they need to be realistic too. So if a client sets a goal that's too ambitious, like they wanna run a marathon in two months, as health professionals, we need to temper their enthusiasm and work with them to set something more realistic, more modest, right? We need to agree upon a goal and collaborate on it. Finally, goals need T, a timeline, right? Something like what the World Health Organization recommends, 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity throughout the week. So for my knee rehab, this means my physio and I should have worked together to talk about something reasonable like do these five exercises three times a week or get my EMG scores back to full strength in six months. I pretty adamantly believed all of these facts about smart goal setting and gave the old video lectures to prove it. Only so many of these ideas were just dead wrong. So what changed my mind? What makes me think that this dogma around SMART goals is incorrect? McEwen and colleagues did a meta-analysis of all the physical activity interventions that focused on goal setting. They included any study that had a control group and that had physical activity as the focus, not performance. So these are rigorous intervention studies, not correlational research. They found 52 interventions and compared the different types of goals in the different studies to see which goals had the biggest effect sizes on physical activity. So let's start by challenging the idea that goals need to be specific and measurable. McEwen and colleagues found no significant difference between goals that were specific and those that were vague. It didn't matter if the goal was just to be more active or to do 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. Both goals had an equivalent effect on people's physical activity. They argued that in the early stage of picking up an exercise habit, vague goals are harder to fail. So people often find them less discouraging if they struggle at the start. If you're gonna set specific goals, they found the biggest effect size was for relative goals rather than trying to set some absolute value. Absolute goals might be something like 150 minutes per week, but they don't take into account the person's current level of physical activity. Instead, it's better to focus on something like do 10 minutes more exercise this week than last week because it's relative to my current behavior and therefore it doesn't seem like such a daunting change. So goals don't have to be specific and measurable. We don't need to set these objective absolute outcomes. Vague goals work just as well for people who are starting to be active and relative goals that are based on my previous level of performance are better than any sort of objective benchmark or guideline. So let's move on to the next part. What do you need to do to work with the client to help make their goals more realistic? Well, there's two interesting findings here. The first is that the difficulty of the goal didn't seem to affect adherence as much, but instead it was about the difficulty of the exercise that they were doing. When people set goals for vigorous physical activities like sport or high intensity interval training, goals were not a good predictor of people's adherence. Goals worked well for moderate intensity training like running or cycling or swimming or even really brisk walking. But when exercise is intense, Enjoyment and adherence are more influenced by how you feel, your physiological signals. Do your muscles hurt? Can you breathe okay? 
These factors are bigger influences on your adherence than psychological factors like goals when people start out on these exercise regimens. So don't worry so much about the difficulty of the goal. Instead, focus on making sure the task isn't too hard. The next finding is that collaborating on a goal didn't make it more likely that the person was going to achieve it. There was no significant difference between goals set by the client, set by the health professional, or following a discussion between the two. In fact, effect sizes were the smallest for collaborative goals and the largest for the goals set by the client. This means if the client comes out with some outlandish goal that might be hard for them to achieve, it seems it's better to let them have that goal and then revise it after a while rather than working with them to lower the bar. So instead of revising goals down to make them more realistic, either set the goal yourself or use the client's goals and then revisit them every now and again. This last one's an important point that's usually ignored by the SMART acronym. Goals that were revised on a weekly or a fortnightly basis were more likely to promote adherence than those which were revised either daily or not at all. On one hand, if you revise goals too frequently, it may feel like the goalposts are shifting every day. On the other, if you don't revise them at all, you can't adjust based on the client's progress. If the client is easily completing their goal, perhaps they want to make it more difficult. If the initial goal turned out to be unrealistic, perhaps they want to lower the bar or set a goal about something completely different. This doesn't mean you need to collaborate on setting goals. Instead, it's just helpful for you to check in every week or so and ask the client if they want to revise their goal or if they want to set something new. As another testament to this, McEwen and colleagues found the effect of goal setting was amplified by the use of some complementary behavior change techniques, or BCTs. What didn't seem to work were rewards. Some people think that rewards might help people focus on the goal, but comparisons that included rewards generally led to lower effect sizes than similar comparisons without rewards. Instead, it seems to help to give clients clear strategies for making progress. As we'll discuss in another video, creating action plans can be a very helpful method for helping to bridge the gap between a goal and the person's current behavior. When using these strategies together, you have what's called a high performance cycle by Latham and Locke. People set goals, they get strategies for improvement, they track that improvement, and then they get feedback on how they're going. Latham and Locke reckon you also benefit from including rewards, but the evidence doesn't support that process here, and neither would the research from self-determination theory. Instead, you have a model that looks a lot like the control theory process described in another video. It's the same process where setting a goal is effective when people can get some objective feedback about how they're going towards that goal, particularly when they know how to bridge the gap. We've come a long way from the SMART acronym, and so far it's not looking so good. The final part to discuss is the T for time bound, remembering the example from the World Health Organization of 150 minutes per week. Weekly goals like this one did not increase people's physical activities by themselves. If I was told to do my exercise three times a week, this doesn't seem to influence my adherence. Instead, daily goals led to improved physical activity, particularly when used in combination with weekly goals. You can see that daily goals by themselves have an effect size of 0.6, but when combined with weekly goals, this rises to 0.947. Both of these effect sizes were significant. So if we come back to my knee rehabilitation, my physio did all the right things, but I didn't know it at the time. We never had a smart goal for when I would be back to sport, but it didn't matter, and here's why. She would test my EMG scores every week, so I got objective feedback about whether I was making progress. I really started to care about these scores, so I worked really hard to try and make them move up. This was the effect of feedback. She also gave me a clear set of strategies that would help me improve my quad strength. I had a few simple exercises I could do wherever and whenever suited me, but she suggested many clients do them at their desk or when they're on their bus commuting. This helped me formulate an action plan. Finally, she let me set the goal, so I started with five minutes a day. I hated physio, I hated training, so this was challenging for me at the time. And while it might be less than the protocol set in research, it was actually something I could stick to, and so I got my confidence from it. I'd tick off my calendar when I did my five minutes, and this allowed me to self-monitor, which is something we've discussed elsewhere. Each week, she'd check in with my EMG scores and help me come up with a new set of exercises to keep me on the right track. She'd also ask me for a new daily goal that I invariably made a bit higher than the last. After all of that, it wasn't easy, but I got back to running before I knew it. And I did it all without any long-term smart goal to aim towards. 